Good morning. Happy Tuesday. I have neural coffee in hand and it is perfect as usual. Okay. So today's a very exciting day. Today is April 14th as I sit here and speak, which makes it Mama Hartman's 87th birthday. So happy birthday to mom. Very exciting. Mom is uh, still kicking some, some butt here. She lives independently. She drives. She exercises a couple times a week. So I just saw her the other day um, to uh, actually pick up my mask, which seems to be the the behavior that we have all adopted in public to protect ourselves um, when we do need to go out. Otherwise, stay home and enjoy your social distancing for now. Anyway, so we got some Q and A's to address. Got a bunch of them that are backed up. So let's let's kill a couple today. Um, first one comes from Zhang. It's in, Zhang says, uh, can you clarify the terminology describing the different regions of the posterior rib cage? Is the posterior rib cage divided into three areas? Uh, posterior lower, dorsal rostral, and upper dorsal rostral. And then he wants to know what shoulder test would identify the location of compression at the posterior rib cage. So I'm going to bring in my little skeleton guy. And, and what we can do is we can kind of look at this thorax um, based on some constraints and then some, some behaviors. And then over time, what we can do is if we, if we identify areas of compression and expansion, we can associate changes in, in shoulder measures that are associated with where this thorax is compressed or expanded. And so if, if we, can, we can simplify this to a degree, we can look at uh, the, the division of the, of the thorax from the scapula down. So if we look at the inferior angle of the scapula at about T7 or so, anything below that will expand and it's gonna provide us uh, a, an element of motion in the shoulder um, that is typically going to be in the early stages of shoulder flexion. So if this area was compressed, what I would see is an early limitation in shoulder flexion. So typically what that's gonna be, is gonna show up as a shoulder flexion measure below 90 degrees. Um, this area is also going to be associated with, with the, the influence of the, the strategy at the ISA. So if I get a wide ISA, this is area is typically going to be expanded. And so I will have access to that lower measure of, of shoulder flexion. As I go up, now I have the scapula and the associated uh, spinal scapula muscles as, as a constraint here. And so if, if that would be compressed, um, I would look at a measure that is farther uh, through the, the level of elevation of the upper extremity. And so this would be more associated with a limitation in horizontal abduction and anything above the, the T4 level, um, I would associate with, with end range shoulder flexion. And, and this is just to do with the shape change of the th thorax, how it positions the scapula and then what motions would be available at the shoulder. So this is something that you can make a comparison with over time to, to confirm or deny this. The nice thing about this is that we also have these constraints on the front. So again, I have the ISA that's associated with this lower posterior aspect, but I also have the sternum and the manubrium, um, which provides some constraints that are also associated with these, these posterior measures. Um, so as I, as I draw my horizontals through the thorax, I have an association anteriorly as well. So at the level of this, this scapula, as I go forward, of course, I've got the ISA. As I go up to the spine of the scapula, that is areas associated with the synchondrosis between the manubrium and the sternum. So the angle of Lewis, depending on your, on your resources. So there's actually a potential to bend the sternum at this level. So I can actually get a down pump handle and up manubrium, which would provide a different uh, resulting measure in the shoulder. Um, and, and so this is how we start to divide the, the, the areas of compression and expansion in the thorax to be associated with certain, certain shoulder measures. So it's just a matter of paying attention over time. Um, the chances of you finding this direct association in the literature is probably slim to none. Um, but again, if you, if you start to pay attention to your measures and you start to look at where these areas of compression and expansion actually occur, um, it's not difficult to make the associations in the shoulder measure. So Zhang, I hope that's, that's helpful for you. Um, I truly appreciate your questions and I will move the skeleton off to the side. All right, question number two. 
Um, one question I've been wrestling with, uh, this is from Marcos, sorry Marcos. Uh, one question I've been wrestling with is what role does the neck muscles play in exhalation specifically? Does depression of the Adam's apple or recruitment of the muscles in the back of the tongue promote better exhalation mechanics? Um, my guess is that they would promote a better head position uh, which affects breathing. So Marcus, what I would say is like, there's not a, there's not necessarily a better or worse, there's just a what is. And so what we wanna do is we wanna identify um, what strategies are available. And if there's a limitation in strategy, then we would wanna obviously recapture the opposing strategy to maximize movement options. So let's, let's make this rather simple. If you look at the hyoid bone, which is at the, the, the top of your, your throat there, you can actually palpate it and wiggle it around. It's that, that really hard, stiff thing at the top of your airway. And that position of the hyoid bone is gonna be associated with inhalation or exhalation. So as the hyoid drops down, the position of the, of the airway is actually an inhaled position. So it's actually, actually big and round. Um, <clears throat> if you've ever taken a CPR class, then you'll know what I'm talking about because the head tilt chin lift actually pulls the hyoid downward. And that's what opens up the airway and allows you to access um, the, the airway to the lungs when you're doing CPR. In the opposing strategy where the hyoid goes up, um, this will be associated with a narrowing of the airway. So it actually compresses the, the airway. This would also be associated with swallowing. So when you swallow, the hyoid goes up and that helps compress the airway. And of course, then you get the, the, the closing of the glottis and, and such when you swallow so you don't choke but there is an airway shape change that's associated with this. So a traditional forward head posture, which is lower cervical flexion, upper cervical extension, actually has the, the lowered hyoid position, which is an open airway, which means I'll have concentric orientation of the musculature below the level of the hyoid, um, which, which again helps promote some of this, this uh, forward head orientation. Um, the opposing strategy, of course, when the hyoid is up is going to be what we would might refer to as military posture, which is lower cervical extension, upper cervical flexion. And I want to be able to move between those two strategies. And that would represent my full capabilities of inhalation and exhalation, as well as my full uh, capacity to, to move my, my neck through its full excursion. So again, I, I don't think that we, we want to look at this as, as one better or worse, we wanna say what is and under certain strategies. So if I'm producing high levels of force, the high end will be up because I'm gonna use an exhalation um, uh, propulsive strategy. And so that would actually help me increase the internal pressures and, and help produce force. When I'm looking to access um, eccentric orientation, a little bit more um, broad spectrum movement capabilities, I wanna make sure that I can open my airway at will. So again, hopefully that gives you an idea of what we're actually looking at when we're talking about respiration at the neck. Um, and, and again, you, you'll see these same associations with some of the iterations in the axial skeleton. So the, the, the descended hyoid position will typically be associated with your people that are biased towards an inhalation uh, strategy in the axial skeleton. Your elevated hyoids are probably gonna be biased more towards your people with an exhalation strategy in the ex axial skeleton. So again, Marcos, I hope that that's helpful for you. If you have any other questions about that, please feel free to ask them. Everybody have a great Tuesday. Again, happy birthday to mom, and I'll see you guys later.